This morning's Bible reading is Psalm 42 and 43, uh, found on page 556. Psalm 42. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while men say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go with the multitude, leading procession to the house of God, with shouts of joy and thanksgiving amongst the festive throng. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. My soul is downcast within me, Therefore I remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day the Lord directs his love. At night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, Where is your God? Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. Psalm 43 Vindicate me, O God, and plead my cause against my ungodly nation. Rescue me from deceitful and wicked men. You are God, my stronghold. Why have you rejected me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? Send forth your light and your truth. Let them guide me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to the place where you dwell. Then will I go to the altar of God, to God my joy and my delight. I will praise you with the harp, O God, my God. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. Thank you for the reading, uh, and thanks for having me. It's really good to finally get to visit Redeemer. Um, I've been down south for a year and a bit now, um, but sadly it's taken that long. Uh, but I've heard a lot about you guys from Isaac. Um, yeah, it's good to finally see you in person. Uh, and thanks for lending us Isaac as well. That's, um, that's been really helpful this week, so I appreciate it. It's a real uh, gift to be able to open up these psalms with you. You might wonder why we're doing two psalms this morning. Um, probably these were originally one psalm, and then somewhere along the line they got chopped into two, because there's similarities, but there's also a few differences. Um, but we're going to deal with them together because they belong together naturally and they're talking about similar things. Um, before we do that though, let me pray and we'll ask for God's help as we read his word. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thanks uh, that you give us your word. It's a great gift that teaches us about who you are, uh, about how this world works and about who we are as well. Uh, and so we pray that as we open it now and as we read it and think more deeply about it, that you will speak to us through it. Please give us ears to hear and hearts that are receptive. Um, help us to understand the difficult bits. Um, but most of all, help us to see you in it, to behold you as you really are in all your goodness and grace and power. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I came to a realisation um, recently. Uh, the realisation is that I could never be a cheerleader. Now I know that's surprising news to you because clearly I have the looks, uh, clearly I have the physique. <laughs> this is sarcasm, just in case, just so we know each other. Uh, yeah, but I realised it couldn't be me, and it, well, actually I realised it couldn't be me, um, not because of those things, although those are real limitations. I realised that if I was to be a cheerleader, I would struggle most with the attitude, because that's, I mean, that's what a cheerleader is all about, isn't it? You see them at the NRL, or you see them uh, at the basketball. What do they have to do? They have to smile all the time. They have to be happy and excited all the time. And I'm like, it's just not me. I'm sorry. That's just I couldn't do it. 
But it struck me as I was thinking about that, I reckon they must struggle with it as well, mustn't they? I mean, there must be days when they wake up and think, I just don't care about whatever sport I'm cheering for. Or, you know, I, I, I'm just really tired, I can't be bothered, I'm just not in the mood. And yet, what do they, I mean, they don't get to just say, look, I'm, I can't smile today, so I can't cheerlead today. That's not how it works, is it? They have to plaster that smile on and go out and do their job and, and, and just pretend. And it struck me that I reckon we kind of feel like we have to do that in life, don't we? Now, maybe not a cheerleader smile, but we kind of have to plaster it on and put on a good face. Uh, we greet each other. How you going? <laughs> and there's really only one answer, isn't there? Fine. Good. Um, or if things are really well, we'll say, not bad. <laughs> but if you were to say, actually, I'm doing it really tough, yeah, it'd kind of be breaking social norms, wouldn't it? We would, oh, that's a bit awkward. How do we deal with that? It's kind of unhealthy, isn't it? And I think we know that. You know, that it's, not, uh, it's good to be honest. It's not good to pretend. But see, I reckon we do it as Christians. I reckon actually we do it perhaps worse than most other people. Um, because we know that we have real and, and, and additional reasons to be extra up. Uh, we have a concrete hope. We have um, forgiveness and grace, all these things that we've sung about before. We have a real hope to look forward to, a God who loves us. We have joy. But when we're honest with ourselves, there are seasons, aren't there, when we're just not feeling it. When we're not feeling it at all, in fact, when the smile is plastered on. And when actually we're inside, we're struggling and finding things difficult. Or we can resonate with the psalmist who we just read. So what do we do? What do we do in those situations? Well, the answer isn't to despair um, and to, to just worry about how broken we really are. There's a much better answer. And so what we're going to do this morning, what I hope to do with you today, is to travel with the psalmist through these psalms, to go with him into the pits of despair and darkness that he's feeling, and to move towards a way out. Now, it's a very honest psalm. You might have noticed that. The psalmist isn't pulling any punches about how he feels. Uh, it's, it, it's not good. <laughs> That's an understatement. It's awful, in fact. Uh, let me just pick up a few verses again. If you've got your Bible, you can have a look at the very start of Psalm 42. Uh, this is what he says about himself. As a deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while men say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God, with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. And, and as you scan through the rest of the psalm, you, you see what he's describing, don't you? He says, I'm panting, I'm, I'm, I'm longing desperately as one dying of thirst. Uh, I feel very distant from you, God. I'm unable to find you. I can only kind of vaguely summon memories of you. As we go on, he talks about being disturbed or being overcome or, or fearful or even in agony, he says. He is in a dark place. Things are especially difficult for him right now. Now what led him to this point? Well, he actually doesn't tell us. He doesn't say, this happened, and so this is how I feel. He doesn't say it at all. Because the point he's trying to make for us is not, this is what makes us feel down. His point is, sometimes this is how we feel. This is the place that we can find ourselves in. And this is how dark it can get for us. And it's all summarised for him in that accusation that he recounts two times. It's there at the end of verse 3 uh, and the end of verse 10 as well. This question, where is your God? And do you notice? He never actually answers it, does he? His unstated answer for us is, I don't actually know because I can't find him either. God feels distant. God feels far to the man who's writing this. 
And to him that is absolutely devastating. Because as we see through the psalm, he is used to being close to God. In fact, God has been the foundation of his life, this, this kind of bedrock that he rests on and relies on. And now he can't feel him. And it's an awful feeling. I reckon it's a bit like swimming in the surf. Um, I love swimming at the beach in, in the waves. Uh, I love that feeling. Um, perhaps you know it as you, as you dive under the wave and you feel it rush over you and you feel the, the power of it. Or you, know, you, you jump up the face of the wave and you look along the line and you just see it as it arcs over. The, like, it's just fantastic, isn't it? The strength of that. Uh, until you get dumped. <laughs> until you misjudge one and you, you, know, you go up the face and then over the falls and you, you get thrown about and you get washing machined. And it, it's not a nice feeling, is it? Uh, the panic sets in. You start to wonder which way is up and which way is down and whether you'll ever get up again. And you're completely powerless. You know, you're, you're completely at the mercy of the sea. And it's awful. And that's how the psalmist feels here. You know, God is the basis of his life and he's lost his footing. He's being thrown all over the place. And he doesn't tell us how or why he feels this way because he's saying, this is sometimes how we feel. Here's a place we end up, distant from God, untethered, and feeling lost and despairing. Now look, there are clear reasons we can point to that we do get this way. There are, there are things that we can identify which lead to these kinds of feelings. Uh, the Bible tells us persistent, unrepentant sin, that sets up feelings of distance from God. When we continue in those patterns, it shouldn't surprise us that we feel distant from him. But it's not only that. Uh, lack of time, of, of real fellowship and community with God's people, that can cause it as well. Uh, the Bible says we meet God more fully when two or three or more of his people get together. And so if we neglect that, it shouldn't surprise us that God feels more, more distant. But sometimes it can be just simple life circumstances, can't it? When we go through a time of upheaval, um, a time of conflict in our lives, or perhaps illness, particularly mental illness, we can go through seasons where God feels distant. And sometimes it can just be. We just find ourselves in that place. And perhaps you know what it feels like. The Bible is just another book. Uh, we read it and... It's just words on a page. It doesn't really go much beyond that. Or we try to pray, uh, and it feels like we're just talking to an empty room, and like our words just kind of echo back to us, and, and that's it. It feels like church is just another thing to do, and we just kind of get this sense that God doesn't really feel like he's there as much, that our, our, our connection or our line to him has somehow been severed. And we know it didn't used to feel that way. In fact, we can remember times when it used to feel completely different. But for some reason, not anymore. And that's a scary place to find ourselves. Why does God allow this? Well, the psalmist actually doesn't tell us here. Perhaps it's to remind us of our need for him. Um, perhaps it's for, to, to, um, for his own good reasons. Good reasons that we may never know in this life. But the fact is, he does allow us here. You will experience, if you have not already or are not at this very moment, we will all find ourselves in this place. But I want to make one thing clear just now. If you're feeling this way, or if you have felt this way, even though that's awful, there is actually in that some good news for you. Uh, I was reading a book recently about a, a guy who climbed Mount Everest and got really bad frostbite and uh, when they he came down from the mountain he was in hospital you know, treating it and every day the, the, the nurses would come in with a needle and would prick his frostbitten toes. They would stab each of them which sounds pretty awful um, but the point was if he could feel it, if it hurt, that was really good news <laughs> because it meant there was hope, hope for those digits, there was life there still. If it didn't hurt, that was bad news. And it's true for us too. If it hurts that God feels distant, if we can feel the pain of that, 
It's not nice, but it's a good sign that not all is despair. We're recognising that something is off. We're recognising that something's missing, that something's wrong. On the flip side, if you've never felt the pain of distance from God, that's actually a concerning sign, isn't it? Because actually, in my experience, and I think in the Bible's testimony too, it's those who are closest to God who tend to feel most acutely that pain of distance from Him. When you do feel it, though, how do we address it? What do we do? Well, the psalmist actually tells us, and he tells us in this kind of... um, plaintive, almost whimpering refrain that that echoes through this psalm. It's there in verse 5 and in verse 11 again. Let me read it for you. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. What do we do? We talk to ourselves. That's what he's doing, isn't it? We talk to ourselves. And not in a kind of a weird, crazy person way. Um, I mean, if that's your thing, go for it. But talk to yourselves positively. Talk positively. Isn't it true uh, when we're down and when things are difficult, our self-talk can become very self-destructive? We reinforce these negative things. We we spiral and we destroy ourselves and think for, sink further into despair. The psalmist invites us to arrest that cycle, to to put a stop to it, to break it. He says, remind yourself, speak to yourself, put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. It's not saying things are great again. It's not a magic formula, you know, say it and you'll instantly feel better. (laughs) It's a reminder, it's a circuit breaker. There is more than what I'm feeling right now. Talk truth to yourself. Because as we go on, we find out that things won't always be bad. That's what the psalmist says. He knows it. And we see it play out as he moves from self-talk to God-talk in Psalm 43. He's spoken about praying. He's spoken of praying to God. But now he actually turns to God and starts praying. So if you've got your Bible, have a look at Psalm 43 and look at the first four verses. This is what he says. Vindicate me, O God. And plead my cause against an ungodly nation. Rescue me from deceitful and wicked men. You are God my stronghold. Why have you rejected me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? Send forth your light and your truth. Let them guide me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to the place where you dwell. Then will I go to the altar of God, to God my joy and my delight. I will praise you with the harp. O oh God, my God. It's quite a turnaround, isn't it? He's gone from my soul thirsts and these things I remember to now, then I will go. You see, he's, he's kind of lifted his eyes, hasn't he? He's looking forwards. He's saying, there are better times to come. There is hope ahead. But how could that be true? How, how could this come about? <laughs> well, it's in the prayer, isn't it? He's told us. Look at what he says. Rescue me. Send me your delight and your faithful care or or, or your your truth. He says, God, I'm in a dark and distorted place and desperate place. I need someone to pick me up out of it. I need someone to rescue me here. I need your light and your truth to to shine into my situation, to, to break that darkness, to break the lies that I'm hearing and believing. That's what I need. I mean, you know what it's like. You, you wake up in the middle of the night and uh, your eyes play tricks on you. <laughs> um, I remember as a kid, we used to have curtains in our bedroom and there'd always be these mysterious and somewhat threatening shadows on the curtains of our bedroom. They always just looked really ominous. Um, was it a robber? Was someone trying to break? I mean, we lived in Ravenswood in Launceston. I don't know if you know it. If you know Launceston, you know what I mean. It was always a possibility. <laughs> Or, you know, I mean, you know what it's like? You've got the chair in the, 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 that shape in the corner of your bedroom and it kind of looks like a person watching you. And you 
You know, you're too scared if I turn on the light. What if it is a person watching me? What if it's true? <laughs> but you flick on the light and, you know, it's just trees outside or it's just, you know, your jumper on, on a chair sitting in the corner. It's nothing, is it? That light dispels the shadows, that, that truth breaks that terrifying lie and you can have peace and you can relax again. And that's what the psalmist says he needs. That's what the psalmist says we need in these times. When we're feeling distant from God, when we're scared and vulnerable and and afraid and hurting and down, that's what we need. We need truth and light. We need something to show us how things really are. We need something to break those lies that we're telling ourselves that crush us and kill us. There is a path to restoration and this is that path. Now just note what the psalmist doesn't say here. He doesn't say, hey God, you're feeling really distant, so I'm going to work my way closer to you. I'm going to resolve to do better. (laughs) I'm going to try really hard and that might fix this situation. I'll, I'll pick myself up by the bootstraps and we'll get out of it. I mean, that's the way we often go, isn't it? I know it's true for me, it's probably true for you as well. Say, wow, God feels really distant. Um, I know what I'll do. I'll get really strict about my Bible reading and prayer times. I'll get up half an hour earlier and, you know, really, really thrash it out. I'll uh, I'll claw God back within reach and make things right again. (laughs) I'll get rid of social media and I'll read a good book. I'll do less TV in the evenings and I'll... We have our strategies, don't we? Say, I'll, I'll drag myself back to God. The common thing with all of them is they're all me. I could do this. I'll do this. I'll try. The psalmist knows a whole lot better than us. You can't do it. You won't do it. But God can. And that's what and that's why he prays. I need your help. I can't do this. But you're good. And so I'm going to trust you. I'm going to ask of you. And I'm going to wait for you to act. And actually that's where the psalm ends, isn't it? (laughs) There is no resolution. He doesn't say, and this is how God answered my prayer. The psalm ends with him repeating that refrain. Now it's more hopeful now, but it's still unfulfilled, isn't it? He says, I've asked God. And that's where I'll rest. I know he'll act in his own time. And this is where we have better than the psalmist. Because thousands of years have passed since this psalm was written, and we don't know how God specifically answered his prayer. But we do know God's broader answer. We do know that God has acted to destroy that distance, to overcome that despair. And we do know that he's done it precisely how the psalmist asked, by sending his light and his truth in the most unexpected way. This is how John's Gospel started. In John chapter 1, verse 9, he writes, The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He says, God's answering. Light is coming. And he tells us, he goes on by saying, the light is good. He says, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So what is this light that breaks through darkness? Well, it turns out it's not a what. It's a who. It's Jesus, God's light incarnate, come to shine in the darkness and to dispel it. It's Jesus who says later, as one of the kids picked out, I am the way and the truth and the life. You see what John pointed out? Jesus is both light and truth incarnate. Come wonderfully sent by God beautifully to this earth so that we could come close to the Father. That's how the verse goes on, isn't it? No one comes to the Father except through me. God has answered the psalmist's prayer. He has sent truth and life in Jesus so that people in Jesus can come close to God in reality, can be near to God the Father. Because here's the incredible truth. The psalmist was onto something. We really were distant from God. 
And not just distant in perception, but distance in reality. It, we didn't just feel as if we were apart from him. We really were apart from him. There was an enormous barrier that stood between us and God. And it was a barrier of our sin that we had put there ourselves. It cut us off from him. And it cut us off from life in him. And there was no way we could ever cross it. There was no way we could ever fix it or break through it. It was absolutely impossible. Until he broke it. Until he shattered that wall. Until his light and truth shone through it into our dark despair and forgave our offence and made it possible for us to come close. See, the real distance between us and God has been breached. It's been taken away. And it's because of Jesus that it's only a perceived distance that we need to wrestle with. So don't despair. When you feel distant from God, that distance is not a reality, it's just your perception. You are not far from God because God has brought you near to himself in Jesus. And his promise is that that is always true. That you are close to him and with him always. Now will you feel distant at times? Then yes, absolutely. There will still be times when this psalm is all too relatable. And I don't know why that will be. God does, but he hasn't seen fit to tell me. But I do know that in those times you can tell these truths to yourself. That you can remind yourself of what is actually real in Jesus. Rather than spiralling into despair and self-destructive talk, arrest it with this truth. Even if you struggle to believe it. And find people around you who will help you to challenge those lies. And go to God. Go confidently as the psalmist went and cry out, Rescue me, God. Send your truth and light to me again. Let me feel them and see them and know them. And may they dispel my darkness. Hold on to Jesus and what he has done. And trust that God will come and help. And like the psalmist, know a better day is coming. You see his celebration, you see what he's, he's looking forward to. I will go to God's mountain, I will go to God's altar and I'll stand before him. And the truth is, once again, we have even more. Because a day is coming when you and I will go to God's mountain, where we will go to God's presence, um, not just in a figurative sense, but truly and physically. In this sheer delight and sheer joy that God is, uh, that the psalmist is describing, going to him, O oh God, my God. The day is coming when all of our distance will be destroyed, even our distance of perception. A day when we will hear those wonderful words. Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. For the old order of things has passed away. Look forward to that hope. What I hope it is. Let's pray and let's celebrate that. May I lead you as we do that. Heavenly Father, we are people who need you desperately. Sometimes so acutely we feel that need for you. For you are life. You are goodness. You are security. You are our rock. And yet, Father, you know that so often we feel that distance from you. And we find ourselves despairing. We find ourselves afraid. Father, thank you for the reminder that that distance is only in our perception, not in a reality. For that reminder that Jesus has destroyed the wall that stood between us and that he has brought us close to you. Father, remind us of that truth. Help us to speak it to ourselves. Help us to speak it to each other and encourage each other in that. And Father, may you be close to us. May we feel the joy of your presence and find our strength and our hope in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.